Welcome back in to another episode of the Future Sox Roundup. My name is Mike Rankin. I'm your host alongside Elijah Evans. Hey, we are on the Broadcast Basement Network. They host the Future Sox Podcast. You should subscribe to the Future Sox Podcast if you haven't already. We are releasing multiple episodes a week. Elijah Evans is working, and we have several interviews lined up with prospects, White Sox prospects. If you're following the podcast already, you listen to Seth Keener, interviewed by Elijah Monday, because we drop these episodes of the Roundup on Friday, but Monday we will drop Jacob Burke with Elijah, and there's a future interview that I don't want to spoil for you. Elijah's got a bunch in the tank, and there's more to come, so be sure you're subscribing. Elijah's going to talk a little bit more about that, but before we get to him, let's talk about what's on tap today. First and foremost, we want to thank the patrons of futuresocks.com. It's what keeps us alive and supports us it's all about you and we want to give back so explore patreon.com forward slash future socks consider signing up it really does help us in what we do on the day-to-day we cover chicago white Sox prospects and the organization listen to the previous episode of the future socks podcast with myself and james fox we release those on tuesdays discuss the front office acquisitions and arizona fall league assignments for white Sox prospects today we are talking double a triple a prospects as the last episode of the roundup covered single a prospects so if you missed that go back and listen to the notable standout performers within the organization today we have a list before we get to that list let's bring in elijah evans because i mentioned it there are white Sox prospects willing to talk to you elijah first and foremost how about that and second of all this is about to get real personal because we get to learn not only about their life on the field, but what makes them tick. So I just want to credit you and share with the listeners as well, if you could, what you have planned uh, for some of these interviews that are going to launch on Future Socks. Yeah, it's good to be here. I hope everybody's doing well. Thank you for that uh, great introduction, Mike. Uh, I'm really excited, and I think White Sox fans are also going to be really excited when we get into this. So this offseason, I'm kind of launching you know, regular interviews with prospects. I've been talking to a lot of guys. Um, I'm really grateful, first of all, that the White Sox have an organization and have started drafting in the last few years just some really good people. From talking to, to more and more prospects, I know I'm sure some of you have seen my content from when I was in Birmingham this summer, um, and now I'm kind of reaching out to a lot of different guys and scheduling interviews with players and just really nice people, ultimately. And it's exciting to learn about baseball, but it's also just great to see that there's genuinely good guys in this farm system right now and people that are just excited to be here, excited to work, and happy to share you know, about themselves and their their game with, with fans because they, they want their name out there and they want to have people see who they are. So it's really exciting for me and it's really exciting for everybody who listens to this show to get, you know, an in-depth kind of personal interviews. We're going to be having, you know, every week or every other week, depending on the week, we're going to have an interview uh, with a prospect, you know, 15 minutes on average of just me kind of talking about baseball, talking about their season, their personal life, hobbies, all that types of stuff. So like, like Mike mentioned, you know, we've got Jacob Berg coming up this week. I've got Jake Peppers, uh, ninth round draft pick this past year coming up as well. And then a bunch of other guys um, that I'm scheduling and working on for the rest of this off season. So we're going to have prospects from all different levels of the system a lot of these recent draft picks from this year or the year before guys that you might not know as well but we'll get a chance to really get to know through these interviews so i'm i'm really excited to talk to these players um, and just hear about who they are and everything that is working for them and everything they're working on um, and i think everybody's going to really enjoy this this new series we're working on yeah it's a big deal we hear about the makeup and the significance of identifying players with character and we get to judge for ourselves thanks to elijah and his hard work again you can follow us on twitter at future socks as well for elijah evans at elijah ev the number eight and myself at Rankin 906 but of course subscribe to the future socks podcast we distribute this podcast uh, wherever you get them itunes spotify and the like so please consider supporting future socks again on patreon we have exclusive offers for you there i'm excited to learn more about jake peppers and of course jacob burke i had a little bit uh of an idea of how jacob burke would be as a person thanks to james fox feature article at the beginning of the season Jacob's going to the Arizona Fall League. That's really exciting because after his full first full professional season spent entirely in single A, both in Kannapolis and Winston-Salem, the White Sox are pushing him, and it makes all the sense in the world. So we're going to continue to follow that story. And it's a great time for Elijah to release this interview because, boy, the Major League regular season is over. The Chicago White Sox trying to avoid 100 losses. We'll see how that turns out. That's what we're celebrating. But 
knowing that the farm system is in a place better than it was four years ago um, makes me feel a little bit more comfortable about what we're going to speak on because we're focused on the Charlotte Knights and the Birmingham Barons mostly when it comes to players close to big league ready, of course. And boy, was this a disappointing season all the way around in that regard. We're going to get to the positives, I promise you. But first, we got to get through this. The Charlotte Knights finished 53 and 96 overall, 35 and 40 in the first half, but 18 and 56 in the second half. Birmingham Barons in double A, 51 and 87 overall, 25 and 44 in the first half versus 26 and 43 in the second half. Let's start there, Elijah, just reacting to those records because obviously it's eye popping coming off the page of you. It's, it's ugly. Yeah, it is ugly. Um, and it's a little bit worrisome for a lot of fans, but at the same time, there is some context around it that makes it a little bit more understandable. You know, Charlotte was kind of with the White Sox being the team they were this year and just not being good in any way throughout the season. Charlotte was kind of this just like back and forth ground for a lot of players, especially in the second half. The majority of the players that were performing well in Charlotte ended up getting bumped to the White Sox because the team had very minimal players around to play. Um, so it's kind of it's a, it was a weird little, like, kind of just in-between spot. Very few high-level prospects were playing in Charlotte. You know, we had Lenin Sosa there most of the year, and Colos was there back and forth between the White Sox. But there, there was really no stability there. There was no, you know, top guys that we were watching for and waiting to make their major league debuts as much. Um, it was really just a kind of a mess of a season in Charlotte, and I think that's going to change a little next year. And then when you look at Birmingham, it, it's fun. It's weird to see the records end the same because Birmingham was a very different team in each half of the season. The first half of the season, you look at a roster that was mostly organizational depth. You know, Colson Montgomery, Brian Ramos, our top two hitting prospects were both injured early in the year. So they were missing time in Birmingham. They both had to work their way back through rehab assignments. Uh, Montgomery didn't end up really playing at all till the second half of the season. So, you know, that was kind of a lot of lack of depth there in addition to having minimal pitching depth there to start the year. But then at the deadline, when the White Sox acquired, you know, Jake Eater, Edgar Caro, Kai Bush, a lot of these other pieces that they got at the deadline, most of those players ended up in Birmingham, which you would think led to a little bit of a better roster. And I do think they performed a little bit better down the stretch um, from kind of August on, as opposed to, you know, the last month and change of the season for Birmingham was a little bit better. Still not great results on in terms of record, but a lot more interesting performers to watch there in the second half. The first half, it just wasn't a lot to see there. And the second half, you also saw a lot of guys get promoted. Um, so many guys we're going to mention on this show ended up making their way from Winston-Salem to Birmingham uh, second half of the year, mid-season, stuff like that. So it's there is context around it. It wasn't pretty for either of those teams, but I do think there is some players in both those levels trending in the right direction now, as opposed to, you know, where they were early in the year where there was really not much to watch there. I think there is, you, you'll hear it today. I mean, there's some really exciting players at both these levels. It just wasn't there consistently throughout the year. And it wasn't exactly the performance that we expected to see from some players. So I, it was disappointing, but I think there is definitely a lot of bright spots within both these teams. Yeah, I think it's important to mention the context, right? Because look, we talk about the way that the White Sox were trying to climb their way out of organizational misery when it came to their farm system for years. And it's not going to happen overnight. And this is the result of what we've been dealing with since you know, post-2019 into 2020, when the majority of their top prospects graduated. They underwent a complete reset in terms of the way they went about the draft. Scouting internationally, they brought in some guys, but not high-impact guys that raised the organizational rankings across Major League Baseball. Largely, it has been the draft in which the White Sox are, are banking on success within the minors. And like Elijah said, at AAA, there weren't a lot of high-end talent uh, because those players still needed time to develop. And that goes to Mike Shirley's credit uh, because of the way that he went about adding talent, younger pieces, something that we haven't seen uh, very much over the last decade plus of the way the White Sox go about their business. So look, it's all a transition and it's important to mention that Charlotte was sort of an extension of the 40 man because the White Sox needed professional depth and they didn't have that with the prospects that they believed could be the core pieces because they weren't ready yet. So you had names like Clint Frazier and the like who were uh, filling a lot of the roster and, and at-bats in Charlotte. And not to discredit those players, but when you're looking at the way the White Sox are trying to compete, you hope that next year it's looking a little bit different on their roster. Guys that you see that 
you can really buy into the fact that they could play a role at the major league level for more than just you know as a, a 4A player where they have more time uh, expected to play in the big leagues than what we saw constructed of the Charlotte Knights roster. And in Birmingham, we talk about the first half of the Birmingham roster, guys were pushed because of, of the standing, again, of the farm system. There was opportunities for several, and it was a struggle. So that's high-end talent that they're playing against, and it was uh, all around not good based on the records. However, when we look at the top 30, and we'll get to the list that we would like to cover today, a lot of the players are making their debuts or experiencing Birmingham for the second time following Project Birmingham. And this time, it's for real, and it's exciting to see that. And as in the last episode, we discussed Brian Ramos and Colson Montgomery among them. They're playing in the Arizona Fall League. That's very exciting. I implore you to listen to the Future Sox podcast that we released this week. Today, we're covering more of the players that stood out and those who we believe are going to make an impact at the major league level coming up shortly. Elijah, you want to begin with Christian Mena because this is a player that we're all keeping eyes on. Yeah, let, let's get into Mena and get into some of these players. Uh, Mena's a really, really fun player. I have been a huge fan of his since I started following him, seeing a little bit of what he was doing last season and then watching him fully this season in Birmingham. And, you know, the numbers don't jump off the page when you first look at it. You know, you see, you know, in Birmingham, he had a 4.66 ERA. He finished the season in Charlotte and had a 5.95, right? So the ERA is not great, but man is a guy, this is a 20 year old pitcher who just threw 133 and two thirds innings you know, at the two highest levels of the minor leagues with 156 strikeouts. He has one of the best swinging strike rates in the entire minor leagues this past season. And his stuff is going to continue to play up and he's has a lot of room to keep growing, right? I mean, this is this is a guy 20 years old and he's already in AAA and spent the entire season. He didn't miss a single start this year, 27 starts, like I mentioned. I mean, oh, tons of innings. The strikeout numbers are ridiculously good. The swinging strike rates are great. And it's really going to come down to the home run ball and the walks for him. Walked 64 guys throughout the season. That's too many. It's got to come down. Um, it's really just when he gets a little bit off with his off-speed pitches and he can't land. You know, he works with both a slider and a curveball, which can both be plus pitches at times. But with Mena, when he gets off with those pitches and he can't land them near the zone, he relies a lot on the fastball. The fastball doesn't have a ton of velocity to it. It sits in that, you know, 92 to 95 range. He can get it up there at times, and he has room to continue to build that fastball velocity. But the issue with him is when he can't land either of those breaking balls, the fastball sit in the middle of the zone, gives up home runs, ended up giving up 18 home runs this year. And that was really where the majority of his trouble came from this season was just allowing too many home runs at times on fastballs that were left over the middle or sliders that just didn't quite break enough. So this is a guy who it's the upside is so obvious and he has a lot of the makings of a really good pitcher. I don't want to them to rush him. I think promoting him to Charlotte was a good decision because he had 23 starts in Birmingham. And despite the walks and the home runs allowed, was getting tons of swinging swings and misses throughout the season. With that said, he needs more time in Charlotte. He needs more time to continue to develop and just hone in on his command a little bit more because it's really, if he can really find those corners with his fastball, this is a guy who could be, you know, a true three starter in the league, um, the way I see it. Um, and I think he's got a lot, a lot to dream on and still plenty of time at 20 years old to grow and to continue to evolve as a pitcher. Yeah, we're all excited about Christian Mena at Future Sox. And you, you mentioned 133 and two thirds innings this year between AAA and AA. That's impressive across 27 starts. And that's piggybacking off of last season when he made 24 starts through 104 and a third total innings. And that was as a 19 year old. This was as a 20 year old. So at 21 years old, I agree with you, Elijah. I think the White Sox are going to remain patient because there are some peripherals that need to get cleaned up a little bit in his game. And we know that he is working on more of a major league pitch miss. And what I mean by that is you know, not, not relying on a singular pitch to get guys out. He is working on multiple pitches to throw in certain situations that he would maybe typically early in his career go to a singular pitch. Now it's a little different. Obviously, the uh, level of competition increases. But at 21 years old, Mena is a fast track to the big leagues. Now, uh, when he makes his debut, that's something we'll monitor next season, but he has to be added to the 40 man roster. So that's step one. And to talk about a 21 year old starter making the 40 uh, man roster, that's mighty impressive. And as we continue, I mean, we're going to go through a lot of these names, but talking about potential starters for next season, 
among the names, Nick Nostrini, Elijah, seems to be a leading candidate for those internal options to make a, a major league debut probably first. Yeah, I think he is definitely the first of the guys we're going to mention today. And I, I'm going to say it. I mean, I, I've been thinking this for a while, and I'm going to say it now. I, I think Nostrini cracks the opening day roster. I, I really do. Um, I think there's not a lot to prove for him left in the minor leagues. And this is a guy who's 23 years old. He'll be 24 on opening day next year. He's a Dodgers grown talent. He's really clean with his mechanics. Um, when I talked to him in Birmingham and I talked to the coaches in Birmingham, there, there's really nothing he's working on mechanically. His mechanics are sound. They're repeatable. They're consistent. And for him, it's another guy who just, it's, it's a little bit of a command issue here and there, but it's not a command issue that makes you, I mean, I think at this point in his career, you're okay risking that command issue a little bit for a guy, again, 139 strikeouts across 114 and two-thirds innings. He's right behind Mena. So him and I found this stat on Fangraphs, and I thought it was great. Mena and Strini had the third and, high, and fourth highest swinging strike rates in the entire minor leagues this past year. Mena at 16.1% and Nestrini at 16%. So this is a guy, they're, they're both missing a lot of bats. Nestrini is a little bit more consistent with a variety of his pitches. His changeup is a little bit more advanced than Men Man Mena. Um, so he's a guy who, you know, relies heavily on the fastball slider, and his fastball is a very, very plus pitch when he's locating it. But the changeup is coming together well, and when he can really get that changeup working, I, I saw a start in Birmingham where he told me after the game immediately, like, when my changeup's working, everything else goes into place more. And it's really, it's an interesting point, but it's a, it's a good thing to think about for him because when he's able to work that third pitch in it makes his fastball that has a natural run on it and his slider that has really sharp movement on it work better when that changeup is kind of complementing them so this is a guy who it, he looks ready his final start in charlotte was ridiculously good if you haven't gone on and watched um, some of the clips from that you can you can find those online um, he finished the season really strong in charlotte you know his when he got promoted his first he had a he had a blow up start in Charlotte in September, but his last start of the season, um, you know, was a five inning sh no hit shutout. So I mean, this is a guy who he finished the season on as high of a note as you can get with a shutout and a no hitter and through five innings. Um, and you know, he he looks big league ready to me. And he's maybe I mean, on some teams he wouldn't be big league ready, but on this team with the lack of organizational depth at the pitching spot, I mean, even if the White Sox were to sign a pitcher or two, there's still rotation spots to be filled. I, I think you give him a chance, and if it's not to start the season, it's pretty soon. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, guys like Jesse Schultons and Tuki Tucson, I mean, they, they've proved themselves to be valuable and they've eaten innings this year for the White Sox. But Nick Nostrini is a guy who I expect to be part of this rotation long term and pretty soon. Yeah, it's exciting, especially when you describe it like that. I think Nostrini is close and uh, we'll see. I mean, Pedro Grafol said it himself. If you want to make the Chicago White Sox in 2024, um, it, you have a shot. Right. There's an op there's going to be an opportunity for you. And Nestrini is close. Uh, speaking of those who are close, Jonathan Cannon. Now, he may not be as close as Nestrini, but he is proving to the Chicago White Sox organization that he can handle starting uh, 25 starts this year, 121 innings between double A and advanced day. He's made 11 starts in Birmingham, 14 in Winston Salem. That's coming off of uh, last year where he barely pitched in the in the professional scene. But that was his draft season was drafted in a third round, and he's 23 years old, right-handed pitcher Jonathan Cannon. We've been talking about him plenty here at Future Sox, you and I, as well as myself and James Fox, uh, as well as all the other writers that contribute. Cannon is a focal point in this organization because there's just a belief that he can do it. He can just be a major league starting pitcher. Now, when that may be, we don't know, but it's close, Elijah. How close? What do you think? He's getting there. I think you saw earlier this year, Cannon just was really good in Winston-Salem. He was consistent. He was, you know, he was getting a good variety of different types of outs. You know, he's not a guy that's going to overpower hitters on the regular, but he can get the strikeouts when he needs to. He induces a lot of solid ground balls. Uh, just, just a good, well-rounded pitcher who throws a lot of different offerings. You know, he's got his cutter, which is really good, but he's mixing in, you know, the fastball, the changeup, the slider. He, he's just got a good, balanced pitch mix and somebody who, like you said, is, is a – it's just a big league pitcher. Like I, I don't think Cannon's a guy who we, who many expect to be, you know, a high level piece for the White Sox long term. But I think he's a, he's could be a four or five starter for a team in the major leagues pretty soon. Um, you know, he did get hit around a little bit in Birmingham. I think he's going to start the year in Birmingham um, just because he had, he had a five seven seven ERA in Birmingham across his last eleven starts um, and really just a little bit of 
further. I mean, the command was a little shaky here and there. Gave up a few too many home runs, but not terrible, really. I mean, there's a few starts that really inflated his numbers. Um, so not not a bad for showing for his first, you know, extended period of time in Birmingham. But I think he starts there next year. Uh, but given, you know, that he's 23 years old and he's going to be 24 next summer, I, I could see him being in Birmingham. Uh, to start the year, I could I, I could see him in Charlotte fairly soon, and there, there's a world in which he finishes the season next year with the White Sox. I don't know if it's – I could see the September call-up. I think that's probably the soonest you see Cannon next year uh, just because I think he needs a little bit more time. He, I mean, this is a guy – despite his age, he was drafted last year out of Georgia, so he's not he hasn't been around for a ton of time. Um, he needs a little bit more time in the minors to kind of figure some things out at the Birmingham level. But I think either the end of next year as a September call-up um, or 2025 for sure. Definitely 2025 piece for the White Sox. Um, and this is a guy who, like I said, he, he's a stable pitcher and he's going to give you quality innings. That's that's a lot of what Cannon does is just continue to churn out quality starts. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at his last, for example, his last, you know, all of August in, in Birmingham, right? No shutout starts, no, you know, excellent perfect games. But five, four of his five starts in August were five innings of one run ball, two run ball, one run ball, four run ball. So this is not a guy who is mowing guys down, but it's just consistent quality starts. So I'm, I'm really curious to see how you know he continues to develop, but I think it's a guy who is just going to be a solid pitcher at the next level as he continues to evolve and should be a, you know, a main piece for the White Sox pitching staff, whether it be, you know, in a long relief role or the back of a rotation role by 2025. I agree with you on the timeline. It makes all the sense in the world to me. Gets through his first full professional season and was impressive at pitching in double A. And another 2022 draft pick is Mason Adams, another arm that we're talking about here on the Future Sox Roundup. This is something to get excited about, Elijah. You're talking about arms that can be considered minor league depth of quality and we're starting to see Mason Adams this season really take on the professional scene with a full head of steam because as a 13 round draft pick spent most of the time in single a Kannapolis that's low a and the White Sox were like you know what how about you try yourself at advanced a Winston-Salem and he was quality across three starts so they gave him a little test in double a and he held his own and that led us to rank Mason Adams at number 30 overall in our Future Sox Top 30 prospect list. And when you look at the pitchers that we discussed today, Christian Mena, he's 7th. Nick Nistrini ranked 8th. Jonathan Cannon, 11. And now, again, Mason Adams at 30. So that's what I'm looking for, is quality depth that can be the backbone of your organizational Top 30. We're finally talking about some pitching here. And Mason Adams, 109 innings total in his first full professional season out of 13th round draft pick, the 2022 draft class is really starting to be impressive. Yeah. And it's a guy, right? Like you're not expecting a 13th round pick to be a future, you know, mainstay, right? That's not necessarily an expectation realistically, but there's so many guys from that draft class last year that are showing themselves to be at the very least strong organizational depth and they can be more. I think Mason Adams could be a, a really quality big league piece. I mean, I, I loved what I saw from him this year. He was kind of pitching in this this piggyback role with Noah Schultz when Miller Schultz was first coming back um, in Kannapolis earlier this year. He did a few starts like that. He had, you know, coming out of the pen, so Mason Adams would throw, you know, innings four through seven or four through eight, whatever it might be. And then he also started starting some games there. So he had a mixture of starts and relieving appearances. And was just great both ways. He was good out of the pen. He was good starting. He doesn't walk a ton of guys. He didn't allow a ton of home runs. He struck out a good amount. I mean, just a one two zero whip. I mean, just a really good numbers across the board. And then it kept being good, right? They I mean, they they promoted this guy who was again. You're you're not expecting a ton immediately from a 13th round pick. And this is a guy who showed out at Canapolis, was consistent there all season that he was there. Three starts at Winston Salem with a two five ERA. Looked great, only allowing, you know, three walks across three starts, 18 strikeouts, just really good numbers all around. Went up to Birmingham, had a little bit more trouble kind of commanding the zone against some more advanced hitters with eight walks across three starts, but limited the damage every time. He didn't end up getting burned on any, on many of those walks, right? And he he continued to just be pitch around it and work through it and with a 270 RA through his three starts in Birmingham. So this guy's, I mean, he's a college draft pick, right? So he's 23 years old. 
And he just pitched at three different levels of the minor leagues in his first professional season after throwing three innings last year. And the complex league, he didn't even play affiliated ball last year. And now he's in Birmingham to finish the season this year. I, I think Mason Adams opens the year in Birmingham with, with a lot of those Birmingham arms like Nastrini and Mana and Cannon, like Amanda mentioned, um, kind of on their way up. I think Mason Adams opens the season as the four or five starter in Birmingham. Um, and that's a guy who, another guy that's kind of getting fast tracked at this point. I mean, you, the, the success is there and it keeps, it keeps showing he he's got quality command. He's just a really consistent, stable arm who does, he's doing a lot of the things the right way and doing them early and often in his career. So I think he could be a guy that, you know, another guy that I could see in 2025 being a piece for the White Sox, even though he, him and Cannon, totally different situations, right? Both 2022 picks, but Cannon came in being an overslot in the third round as a guy who the White Sox didn't even think probably was going to fall to him, uh, fall to them in the third round. Um, and they end up getting him in the third. Mason Adams is a 13th round pick out of Jacksonville. Um, and he, you know, ends up being having as good of a season as Cannon did this year, if not arguably better. Yes, it was more in Canapolis at the lower level, but he was he was excellent this season. The numbers show for themselves, really. Um, so I think he's a guy we could see again, twenty twenty five for the White Sox potentially. Uh, you know how I feel about starting pitchers if they're making their starts and they're adding innings, especially early in their young career, first professional full season for Mason Adams. Say that a lot. Uh, acknowledging first full professional seasons and these White Sox prospects took them all in stride. Now we talked a lot about the pitchers in double A and triple A, even some who sprinkled some time in, in single A. How about we do this? Let's save the hitters for our next episode and touch on a couple of more arms that I want to make mention. We'll, we'll talk double A and triple A hitters, position players that stood out to us because Elijah has a list prepared, of course, as we're always prepared here in the Future Sox Roundup. I want to talk about Sean Burke a little bit. This is a player who was on the 40 man roster to begin 2023. And Chris Getz, who was uh, not in the role he was at, at the time uh, of the you know, beginning of the 2023 season, of course, still overseeing minor league operations. Now the GM, he listed Sean Burke as major league depth potential. And that was at the beginning of 2023. Sean Burke threw 36 and two third total innings in 2023. He was put on the development list multiple times. And the development list is just a, a way for minor league organizations to keep them on their roster without having uh, any roster implications added to them. So th- it's just kind of like, Hey, uh, we're going to replace you with a player, but you're still a part of, you know, AAA depth. We want to work with you off to the side, whether it's in Arizona or any other location. They were taking their time trying to work with Sean Burke, and he just did not have the season any of us had envisioned. However, still on the 40 man and still looks to be part of the future for the Chicago White Sox, as well as Kai Bush and Jake Eater, two pitchers who were added outside the organization. Jake Eater, the number six ranked prospect on the Future Sox Top 30. He is going to the Arizona Fall League, had such a bizarre season. We talked about the difficulties that Jake Eater faced at the beginning of the year this year on our last podcast, uh, Future Sox podcast, myself and James Fox. Eater fractured his foot, and that was a year after he suffered an elbow injury that required Tommy John surgery. So Eater had a, if you look at the numbers, not good, had a very uneven season this year, not only rehabbing from multiple injuries, but also entering a new organization and trying to make his way with the White Sox. Kai Bush, a little bit different, an older prospect, and got knocked around during his time with the Chicago White Sox, acquired obviously from the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim this year, but 6'6", to strike at the walk rate, not exactly what you're looking for, but this is, again, another pitcher adding to the depth of the organization that is advanced enough to at least be optimistic, feel like he could pitch at the big league level next year, whether that's out of the bullpen or as a starter. Ideally, it's a starter. Kai Bush was very underwhelming, in my opinion, when he entered the organization, but I think for all of us, Elijah, it's good that the season is ending So they can finally take a step back and understand that, okay, we let you have all of this time to develop. Now it's time to make some serious strides in your professional career. Yeah, no, it's a tricky situation when you look at all three of these players, because it's hard to evaluate the the difficulty between, you know, dealing with injury and physical changes and also trying to become 
you know, a player who we want them to be in the future, but it's, you got to take everything with a grain of salt because I don't want to look at these players and I don't want anybody looking at these players. And I, I see too many people looking at players of this type where they're dealing with injuries and they're dealing with changing things mechanically and looking at them and saying, oh, they're not panning out. I, I don't believe that to be the case. And I, I just, I'm not going to approach it that way when you think about what these players are dealing with. And you have to remember, it's not easy dealing with an injury, first of all, and then second of all, getting your body back in shape and trying to adjust and get your mechanics to where you want them to be while pitching every fifth or sixth day, right? So it's that's what I mean. A guy like Eater and Bush, you know, they were they were pitching every they were making all their starts for the most part in Birmingham down the stretch, but their bodies weren't quite there. They were working on their mechanics throughout the week while pitching still. And yes, you want them getting those innings, and it's important to keep the repetition up. But at the end of the day, they need to get their body right and they need to get their arms and their mechanics feeling right to have any chance of being what we want them to be in the future. So I don't, I'm a numbers person. I love looking at numbers and it's important to take numbers and analyze them and think about them and look at the trends players are making. I'm just not putting that much stock into the numbers of any of these three players this season. And you can take that as you want. You don't have to agree with me. You can look at their numbers and say, I don't think these guys are going to be that good. Sure. But the upside is there. We've seen it. They're all, all three of these guys were, you know, had pedigree coming into the organization. You know, Eater was a high draft pick. I mean, Burke was a third rounder, I believe. And these are, these are guys that are, that have established themselves and have potential to be really good pieces for the White Sox. And this off season for them is all about getting their bodies right and getting back on the mound, the mound next year with stable mechanics and a plan for their future. Yes. They're all a little bit older. Eater's 24, Burke's 23. Um, I mean, it, it's, you want them to get there and you want them to get there soon, but you have to get your body right to have any chance of succeeding on the mound. And that's just, that's just how it goes. So I, for one, am excited to see all three of these pitchers next season with healthy years. I think both Eder and Bush will start in Birmingham. I think Burke will probably go back to Charlotte, even if his body isn't completely there. Uh, maybe he goes down to Birmingham for a little bit. Um, but I think it's really just about getting these three pitchers back in a pitching shape and getting their mechanics stabilized and just seeing what they can do when their bodies are feeling right. And that is something that we have to be patient with. And I know we don't want to be patient with it and we want to see the results, especially for a guy like Eater who was traded in the Jake Berger deal and Bush who was in the Giolito deal. And we want to see those results from those trades pay off, but you got to give them a little time. And like we just mentioned earlier in this episode, there's a lot of pitchers in this organization more than there used to be that are going to be ready to help soon. And I think there's a chance that any of these three could help soon as well, but you don't have to put the pressure on them of we need these guys to be ready in 2024 to pitch for the White Sox because we don't. We have other options. The White Sox aren't going to be all that competitive in 2024. So in my mind, you're looking at next season as the building block and the step to the big leagues for these types of players who can use next year once they get their mechanics set this offseason to really just get on the mound and gain that consistency and then look towards 2025 as a time where, you know, like all these other guys we've mentioned, right? I'm looking at 2025 and seeing, you know, eight, nine starting pitchers that could be options for the White Sox. All, will all of them be? Probably not. Will even half of them be? Maybe. I don't know. But you got to be patient and you got to give these guys the time they need to get their bodies in the place they need to be. Yeah, I think it's very important what you're talking about there, Elijah and people. I Look, they, they're they sick of waiting. The patience is difficult to sell, especially with the lack of success across the number of years trying to build with the White Sox, uh, whatever they were trying to do, right? But uh, we just mentioned a list of arms that expect to be the foundation. However, you cannot expect them to pitch the bulk of the innings required to get through a major league season in 2024. You're putting them at a disadvantage and you're hurting the development of these professional ball players, if that's the plan. And I don't believe that is the plan. I, I think what to expect from Chris Getz is a built rotation of guys who have done it before, those who you believe can get you through starts, fill innings, competitive innings. They better be competitive innings. But you have that foundation as your future, a, a plan to look ahead. And we'll figure out that plan based on the way Chris Getz and his staff goes about this offseason. It's going to be imperative to protect these young arms in the farm system because otherwise it's just going to be a constant cycle of recycling arms that just aren't good enough to pitch at a competitive level when the White Sox are trying to compete. I, I'm buying into the early foundation of this thing. 
I can't help it because there's flashes of players that suggest that they can play at the big league level. Now, can they compete at a high level? We're going to find out. That's on the player development side and the individual themselves. But there's a lot of signs that at least signal that the White Sox have a bit of a plan here. We'll see what they decide to do in the offseason. There's more to talk about on the Future Sox Roundup and the Future Sox Podcast. Be sure you're staying tuned to futuresox.com because we're covering everything. The Arizona Fall League begins October 2nd. We just went through the list of pitchers, double A AA and triple A. We had anticipated to get into the hitters, but ran out of time this week. We'll talk about it next week. There's a list of guys that at least should be on your radar as we look ahead to what will be a fresh, and I think uh, it'll be refreshing for all of us to see a new 40-man roster with, with names that we believe are part of the core of the Chicago White Sox moving forward. Elijah said it, 2025 is sort of the goal, and I'm with him. 2024 can be that bridge to 2025 if you do things the right way. And in my opinion, the right way is developing your minor league talent and valuing these draft picks. So we'll see. We'll see. Chris Getz, good luck to you. For Elijah Evans, my name is Mike Rankin. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Future Sox Roundup. Make sure you're listening for Elijah's interviews moving forward. Jacob Burke coming up on Monday. And we have more to come here on the Future Sox podcast. Thanks so much for listening.